ready to write down your thoughts that come to mind as you watch the video. And now, here's Scott Caesar. It was like most mornings in Capernaum for Benny Bar Jonah. The year 33 AD promised to be as dismal as the year before was. Benny would lay his head in bed, waiting for a reason just to get up, let alone to want to smile. Having his body paralyzed from birth was one thing, but having your mind speak like there is no God was another. Soon his small platoon of four friends would be over with their usual well-intentioned but annoying word of daily hope that God is real and he does heal. Even before the usual shalom greeting, Marty yells out and starts talking about a man named Jesus. Well, he just healed Harold the leper from Galilee. Seymour shouts, I was told Jesus is in Capernaum at a house just down the road. Benny, we're going to take you there right now to be healed. Benny, doubtful yet hopeful, smiled at his team of faithful friends and reluctantly agreed, saying, okay, but hold on to my mat this time, the last time you guys dropped me. We speculate tongue-in-cheek this part of the story, but we don't have to speculate what happens next as we read about it in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, in the passage I like to call the friendship of the mat. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. You may know the rest of the story, but I'll paraphrase for you. Jesus discards the Pharisees' attempt to question his authority. He then turns to the paralytic while smiling at his four friends of faith and says to him, My precious, precious son, your friend's loyal faith has made you whole. Arise and pick up your mat and go home, for you have been healed. You see, Benny came into Jesus carried on a mat, but walked out carrying his mat in his arms. May I ask you a question? What type of faith did this band of brothers have that did not distract Jesus, but instead attracted his gaze? Maybe their faith alone was not what attracted Jesus. Could it be that this small band of brothers reflected the unparalleled oneness that Jesus experienced within the eternal trinity? In seeing their faithful friendship and loving unity, Jesus may have even acted upon the 133rd Psalm where it says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Gentlemen, brotherhood takes a man to a place he will not go to on his own. Welcome to Session 5, SEAL Team, A Band of Brothers. Previously on The Mission Driven Man, we spoke about freedom, your freedom, won at the cross by your Savior, brother, and friend, Jesus. We saw Jesus opposed and now know that we are also opposed. We trained ourselves to recognize the enemy's stealth strategy to enslave our souls. We then looked how Jesus modeled spiritual warfare with what should be every man's first weapon of choice, the Word of God. The power of four then showed us that spiritual maturity is most likely to occur after four weekly touches of the Word of God. In this session, we will focus on the fourth touch we call team time. Let's rewind to where we were in the fifth chapter of Galatians, where the Apostle Paul gives his guys a directive and objective in Freedom's mission. He says this, it is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence. Love others 
as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. Let us heed this warning against destroying our freedom and instead let us help it to flourish through godly relationships. C.S. Lewis in his classic book, The Four Loves, places friendship at the highest level of those four loves. I paraphrase him saying, few value friendship because few have experienced it. Can it be possible that the reason men have so few intimate allies is because they never really experienced friendship? With the Bible telling us how vital friendship is to our freedom and how rewarding it could be in our lives, why then are Christian men not intentional in its pursuit? The facts bear this out as the statistics are startling. Alan Lloyd McGinnis, author of The Friendship Factor, says that America's leading psychologists estimate that only 10% of all men ever have any real friends. A decade-long research of 5,000 men and women by Michael McGill confirms this report. He says, to say that men have no intimate friends seems on the surface too harsh. But the data indicates that it is not even far from the truth. Even the most intimate of friendships, of which there are few, rarely oppose the depth of disclosure a woman commonly has with another woman. Men do not value friendships. The writer of Proverbs affirms this and warns men by saying, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. Did you hear that? Isolation leads to an unhealthy mind, one that likely will make wrong decisions. For we know the worst decision a man can make is the one he makes alone. It's an epidemic that starts with isolation, then progresses to the social disease called loneliness. For a lonely man is not one who does not know anybody, but one who nobody knows. My friend, Men are as sick as their secrets and as healthy as the friendships they build and sustain. Author John Piper takes it to another level, saying this, Without good friends, you will die. I believe it is the word of God that if you have no such cluster of comrades in the faith, then you are neglecting one of the means appointed by God for the preservation and endurance in faith. And to neglect the means of grace is very dangerous for your soul. Gentlemen, it seems a man can well live without friendship, but without friendship cannot live well. Our goal in this session is simple, to uncover the value of godly friendships and to provide a simple blueprint to intentionally pursue it. First, I would like to point you to an example of what biblical friendship looks like one that we can model and practically apply for this all-important mission. We will draw out two pictures, two snapshots, if you will, of Scripture from one of the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. Let's start now by witnessing what many consider the greatest example of covenant friendship. In 1 Samuel, we find David hitting the height of stardom as the Michael Jordan of the Israeli army. There was just one problem. King Saul viewed David's success and popularity with the evil eye of envy. Saul's jealousy led him to attempt to kill David. This drove David into the wilderness to hide from him with only one person, one loyal friend who he trusted, the heir to Israel's throne, King Saul's son, Jonathan. We read in 1 Samuel 23, 16 this. And Jonathan... Saul's son rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. He said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul my father also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horesh, and Jonathan went home. Jonathan engaged David four ways every great friend and ally does when his brother is hurting and fearful. He strengthened David's hand in the Lord, not in and of himself, but in the Lord. He did this by encouraging David, confirming God's promise to David, saying, You will be king. 
He also admonished David's fear-driven mindset, saying, do not fear, and replaced it with a faith-driven mindset. Lastly, Jonathan sacrificially loved David by first risking his life and going to him and willingly giving up his rightful place as king. The prince who would be king loyally submitted to David as God's chosen king. Then to strengthen David even further, Jonathan renews their covenant that the two of them made earlier as best friends. Jonathan strengthened, encouraged, admonished, and loved David. Let us now fast forward to the Apostle Paul's instructions regarding the same four ways of brotherly love starting from 1 Thessalonians 5.11 in the Amplified Bible. Therefore, encourage admonish, exhort one another, and edify, strengthen, and build up one another just as you are doing. And we earnestly beseech you, brethren, admonish, warn, and seriously advise those who are out of line, the loafers, the disorderly, the unruly, encourage the timid and faint-hearted, help and give support to the weak souls, and be very patient with everybody always keeping your temper. Paul seals it in Romans saying, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Man of God, do you see the four ways of masculine friendship? Brothers are to strengthen one another, encourage one another, admonish one another, and love one another. You see, we've taken the first letter of each of the four words and created the acronym SEAL to represent a small group of Christian men who put these four ways of masculine friendship into practice. We call this band of brothers SEAL Team. Similar to the size of a Navy SEAL fire team, SEAL Team is a group of three to four other men who will walk with you through God's mission for you. Can a man truly surrender to God without being in submission to the needs of a brother? Scripture tells us loving submission to the needs of another is a characteristic of a life surrendered to Christ. Let's now summarize the four ways of a SEAL team operative. He strengthens by carrying his brother's burden. He is his brother's keeper. He encourages by speaking words of hope promise and destiny to him. He admonishes by challenging patterns of behavior that may lead to potential trouble and sin. He loves by accepting his brother, but not his brother's standard for sin. For to accept another man's sin is to accept his failure. To accept another man's failure is to accept the standards that led him to his sin. So you accept your brother And by accepting him, you walk with him in the valleys, but not in accepting his beliefs and habits that are contrary to the word of God. For when that is done, you put yourself and your family at risk. SEAL Team is not a group to conform to, but a group to transform with. We conform to Christ, not to man. The most Christ-like man is the one who's most like himself. For when a man is most unique is when he is most Christ-like, as identity is not found in individuality, but in unity. You now may be thinking, okay, Scott, sounds good, but where do I start? What type of men would I join with? How would I enlist other friends into a SEAL team? All great questions that I will address in our next session so that no man will be left behind. Man of God, a small band of brothers, a SEAL team, will give you the permission needed to take mountains for God and family. Permission comes from an intimate ally, a friend, or a small group sewn together by their need and desire to grow in Christ. God intends for us to weave our lives together The Bible calls this fellowship. We call it SEAL Team. Friendship is experiencing life together. With our guys, we hear each other's stories. We discover each other's strengths and weaknesses. We learn to walk with God together. Author John Eldridge says it well. We pray for each other. We cover each other's backs. 
This small core fellowship is the essential ingredient for the Christian life. Jesus modeled it for us with the 12. He lived in a little platoon, a small fellowship of friends and allies. A true fellowship is something you'll have to fight for. You'll have to fight to get one, and you'll have to fight to keep it afloat. Believe me, you will fight. The enemy knows how powerful we become with these allies. He will come against you and your guys. The only way to combat this attack is with a SEAL team of brothers to protect you. Every man needs to be involved in a small group. Hopefully, this is through your local church, but if not, it must be hotly pursued with the Christian men you know. This is where the real community takes place. It's the Acts 2 franchise all over again. Brothers, we need each other. We need comrades in arms who will fight for us, someone who prays for us, a guy who loves you enough to read your face and ask, you okay, man? One that fights for you and even against you for you. God made you to fellowship and be discipled with a band of brothers who will walk with you on the mountaintops and, if need be, carry you through the valleys. You see, Christ-like maturity can be defined by a man's ability to give and receive love. This love is not of human origin, but is a divine one found in our Savior. Jesus was our model for manhood because he was the model for love. Jesus said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus' stunning prayer in John 17 echoes the eternal fellowship between him and the Father. He placed great value on friendship, and Jesus invites you and me into a oneness relationship with him and Father God. He engages it further by asking that we all may be one as he is one with the Father. We must pursue this great asset of faith so that we become one with our brothers. To hear and see Christ, we need to hear and see our brothers in Christ. For men who seek to know God's will must seek men who know God well. A lot of times men get together, they don't know really what to say or how to lead. And here is instruction. And I, and I just want to encourage uh, and just uh, applaud uh, Pastor Scott, uh, Coach Steve, uh, Coach uh, Mike, uh, well, I mean, Coach, but my brother Mike, uh, you know, for the work and the effort that they've done in putting this together and making it available. Okay. And as Coach Steve said, this is going to be available in June to affiliate churches. And what I want to do right now is, is again, take up an offering uh, for the ministry. And what specifically today, okay, I'd like to talk about real quick. Uh, hey, if you men want to join us in uh, putting together funds, okay, putting together funds to market and release, all right, the mission driven man to the general public, okay? You can, okay? So first, let me cover the three uh, specific ways uh, that we talk about, uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, how to donate to the ministry. And that is by texting. You see the number on the right side. Uh, the number is there, 833-500-4685. You can also give to mensdiscipleshipnetwork.com. See that on the left side and follow the donate button. Or you can write a check bottom right, to the ministry at 27 Grand Avenue in Farmingdale, New York. But what I want to do is say, okay, we're looking to raise funds for the ministry, all right? The tar a target amount is, let's say, $68,000, $70,000, okay? And that is, I hope I didn't upset anybody. Someone dropped the, you know, the <laughs> I didn't alarm anyone. But we're trying to raise, or we will raise money, money to release this. This is a gold mine right here and the content and what's involved and everything you could see. And it, it is gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. And if you want to participate, 
okay? You want to participate. Um, we're, we're encouraging you to donate to the ministry for Mission Driven Man. There's a category on the website or, or in the donate button that says specifically, okay? Donate to Mission Driven Man, okay? You'll see that. Mission Driven Launch Fund. And we'll use those funds to put together our, the strategy on how to you know, market and release this beautiful, beautiful content. So, uh, you know, what I'm going to say right now is, you know, and I'll, I'll just, if I can, pray for two seconds and say, Father God, in the precious and mighty and wonderful name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we, we thank you this morning for the men that are on this line, Lord, and we praise and glorify you, Lord. And this morning, we're, we're asking uh, for a touch, a touch from you, Lord. Touch the men that are on this line and uh, let's open our minds and open our hearts and prayerfully just to see how we can help, how we can assist in the release of this uh, gorgeous content, Lord. So, Father God, we praise you, we glorify you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, above all, for all that you do, Lord, and, and touch in each every man on this on this. Uh, this call, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord.